In September 1995, Pierre Omidyar finished the code for what would soon become eBay. He needed to test the site, so he listed a broken laser pointer for auction. To his astonishment, it sold for $14.83. Omidyar sent a message to the buyer to make sure he understood it was broken. The buyer replied, oh yes, I'm a collector of broken laser pointers. Auctions were just one feature on Omidyar's website, but he realized then that the variety of goods that people would buy and sell on the internet was beyond anyone's imagination, and he abandoned his other projects for this one, which ended up making him one of the richest people in the history of the world. It's pretty surprising to me that there was someone out there looking for broken laser pointers on random websites back in 1995 and that the price was bid up to almost $15. In 1995, you could get a full tank of gas for that kind of money. This is the paradox of trade. How is it possible that in virtually every single one of the billions of trades or purchases people make every day, that both sides of the transaction celebrate the results? How is it possible for both sides to win? The answer you no doubt already know. One person's trash is another person's treasure, as the saying goes. In other words, people have different preferences. Some people prefer tacos to cheeseburgers, and others prefer cheeseburgers to tacos. Here's one of the biggest assumptions we will make. In economics, we assume that everyone is able to rank absolutely every choice available to them, from best to worst. By assuming that people can rank the options available to them, we're assuming that their preferences are complete, meaning each person can compare every possibility to every other possibility, reflexive, meaning that identical options are ranked in the same place, and transitive, meaning that if we prefer pizza to chicken nuggets, and we also prefer chicken nuggets to ice cream, then we must also prefer pizza to ice cream. Preferences do not need to be consistent over time. You're allowed to change your ranking whenever you want, and it's okay if options are tied with one another. But with this little assumption of ranking, we're able to unlock an entire theory of consumer behavior. Now, I know you're probably sitting there listening to this video either nodding along or yawning it away, but allow me to challenge you for a second. Here we are making an assumption about what's going on in people's heads. When faced with the decision of what to have for lunch, for example, we assume that people identify every option available to them and rank them from best to worst. And not just what they will eat, but where and when and with whom they will eat. Every permutation of the decision can be accounted for and ranked without contradiction. Or at least people behave as if that is what they are doing. So if people's brains have good heuristics that are able to identify all potentially high-ranked options and compare them, that's fine too. You don't have to consider eating dirt every time you pick something for lunch if there's no chance of it outranking other feasible options you do consider. Anyway, here's my challenge. Think of an objection to this assumption. Think of a reason this could be wrong. Then try to think of a good response to that objection. This kind of thoughtful criticism is a valuable skill and economics is an excellent playground to practice it in. Anyway, moving on. Utility theory is a way of modeling people's preferences mathematically. Utility is the ability of something to satisfy our needs and wants. If I am hungry, a sandwich has a higher utility to me than a glass of water does. If I'm thirsty, the opposite is true. But what we get from this theory is that this property can be expressed numerically. I can measure the usefulness of something with utility. So I might say that a sandwich will give me 10 utils, the units of utility, 
while a glass of water would only give me five. Since ten is more than five, I know I prefer the sandwich to the glass of water. Unlike assuming people can rank the options available to them, this isn't a big assumption. All we want out of this are utility functions, which are mathematical expressions that can rank options the same way we do. What do I mean by mathematical functions? I mean literal mathematical functions. In math, a function is an expression that takes in values for any number of variables, a, b, c, etc., and then transforms them into a single output value. For example, we might say that my utility, my well-being, is defined by the quantity of pizza and burgers that I get. Let's look at some examples to make this more concrete. Perhaps my utility function is simple. I just add the number of slices of pizza I have to the number of burgers I have. If I have two burgers and three slices of pizza, my utility would be five. If I have one burger and five slices of pizza, my utility would be six. And if I had zero burgers and eight slices of pizza, my utility would be eight. These values for utility are not particularly important. What is important is that this function ranks the options first, second, and third. If I say my utility function is pizza plus burgers, all I am saying is that this function ranks the choices the same way I would with my preferences. In other words, the utility function represents my preferences. Here is another example. Perhaps our function is pizza times burgers. This first option would give me six utility. The second option would give me five utility. And the third option would give me zero utility because eight times zero is zero. This utility function returns the reverse ranking. And maybe that is how someone else would prefer things to be. Utility functions can be anything. It could be pizza plus the square root of pizza, all squared, plus burgers, minus five times burgers, all divided by the ratio of pizza to burgers. It doesn't really matter how complicated the mathematical function is. All that matters is that these functions rank things the same way we do. Utility theory lets us see why two people would agree to a trade. Suppose these two people each have one of our two examples for utility functions. If the guy on the left starts with two burgers and three slices of pizza, while the guy on the right starts with one burger and five slices of pizza, they both start with a utility of five. But if they trade one burger for two slices of pizza, both of them end up better off. They both prefer this new bundle to the old one because they both have six utility now instead of five. It doesn't matter that they both have the same value for utility. One could have a utility of 60,000 while the other is at negative 600. All that matters is that the trade increased their utility and that is why they agreed to it. It was beneficial for both of them both sides of the trade won. They both ended up better off than before the trade. One of the key ideas of economics is that trade can be mutually beneficial because people have different preferences. And because of that, the ideal outcome is one where all mutually beneficial trades have happened. That is the case for us now between these two people. There isn't really a way for these two to trade pizza and burgers and both end up better off. And that is why, according to economists, that this distribution of pizza and burgers is the best distribution given their starting quantities. One goal of the economy then is to facilitate all mutually beneficial trades. Of course, for most of us, the trades we will make will be made with money and we only have so much. Next, we'll see how we account for our limited budgets.